Time to shine today, Podcast Varsity Squad. This is Scott Ferguson, and I got my uh, spec list, his glasses list, my good friend here, Gregory Offner from the Global Performance Institute. And this guy's got a super phenomenal story, but he's also like backed by a ton of you know good certifications, uh, some of that I can't wait. I'm ready to take notes. So if you're taking notes on paper or a digital note taker, make sure you get that ready because we got Gregory Offner. He's a multi-talented individual with a passion for entertaining and educating others. His keynotes, which you have to check them out, squad, and workshops and corporate consulting engagements help the world's leading organizations create high-performing, highly fulfilled leaders. Prior to this work, Greg led global, led global sales and marketing efforts for several Fortune 100 organizations brokered complex risk management insurance programs for large commercial organizations, and drove process improvement initiatives as a certified Lean Six Sigma practitioner. But during that time, Greg lived a double life. By day, he was a suit and tie wearing professional and glasses too. But under the cover of night, Greg is better known as, well, that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. And Greg, thank you so much for coming on. Please introduce yourself to Time to Shine Today Podcast Varsity Squad. But first- yes. God, What's thanks for having me, man. Color oh, and why? My favorite color is the color blue. All right. I have no idea why it's my favorite color, but I learned something about it maybe two years ago. I was having right. a conversation with a meeting planner, and she was asking about my my branding because if you go onto my website, most of my branding is a mix of blue and yellow, nice complementary yeah. colors. And she said, "Which is your favorite, blue or yellow?" I said, "Blue." She said, "That's interesting because with your background in." singing and speaking and all the issues with your voice, which I know we'll get into, Scott. She said, did you know that blue is the color of the voice chakra? Now, really? I am not a chakra type person. Right. Uh, but I thought, well, maybe that does, maybe there's something there. Maybe it makes sense. Or maybe not. I don't know. But blue is my favorite color. <laughs> well, that's, that's all, and it's in your color, Will, your handsome devil. So, I mean, I'm sure you, when you rock the blue, it looks good. And I got the you know, Atlantic Ocean I'm looking at right now, and that's mighty blue itself in my area. I'm in South Florida. I'm about 60 miles north of Miami and Jupiter, and blue is my thing. Sometimes I say purple because, you know, I got a little red streak that can kind of come out. And they mesh together, but no, man, yeah. seriously, thanks for coming on, and I really want to get to the roots of, you know, where you really started because I know that maybe tell us a little bit about the suit and tie and knowing that there was more out there and in breaking out, getting out of that in the Clark Kent into the uh, the superhero, bro. Well, as a keynoter, I'm I'm really a glorified storyteller. Um, there are stories <laughs> with a purpose, yeah? And what that has to do with my journey from suit and tie to where I am now is the stories we tell ourselves. The stories we tell ourselves have power because they are on repeat all day long in our mind. Wow. And if those stories don't paint an accurate picture, we can create false beliefs. And I had told myself stories about what it meant to be a professional musician, what would have to happen for me to be the type of person that became a professional musician. And those stories became so powerful that by the time I graduated college, I didn't believe that I could be a professional musician. So I did what I thought the world expected me to do, tried to find a place to fit in professionally. Sure. And I fell into the world of sales and marketing. It happened to suit my background that I'm generally good with people. I'm generally good with words. I'm generally enjoy meeting new people and persuading them about things. It used to be selling products. Now, really, I'm selling ideas from the stage. I'm trying to get you, to, the, the listener, to buy into the idea that work doesn't have to suck, that we can take the irk out of work, and that it's possible to be high performing and highly fulfilled. So while I was amidst and, and in, involved in this day job of sales and marketing and working in the world of risk management, I had this night job as a dueling piano performer. You, you did that. I did that. And so the wow. day job satisfied the financial needs. Yeah. And the night job satisfied the internal, the fulfillment engine. Wow. But in 2015, I realized uh, that, that I had something going on with my vocal cords. I wasn't able to speak or, or to sing. It came on pretty suddenly. And when doctors investigated the trouble, they told me that I had about two months until I lost my voice permanently and irreversibly. Wow. 
They said you can either do what you're doing, and in two weeks, two months, maybe a little longer, we don't know, your voice will be gone. Or you can undergo vocal cord surgery and have a shot at regaining your speaking voice. We, we think your singing voice is gone. Now, anybody who knows anything about music knows that there are lots of vocal professionals, singers, speakers, who have undergone this surgery and it didn't go well. I'm thinking of the woman who was in The Sound of Music and her name's escaping me, but right. uh, you know, very beautiful voice, can't sing anymore because she had a vocal cord surgery that went, that went wrong. Mm. I opted to have the surgery, but I, I tried to negotiate with the surgeon because he told me it was going to be eight to 12 months before I'd be able to have a conversation again after this surgery. Mm. And I said, well, is there a way that we can maybe ramp that up to six to eight weeks? You know, I got this day job, like I gotta make money, I gotta pay my bills, I gotta sustain this lifestyle I'm living. And so for whatever reason, he allowed me to do this. And as a result of negotiating less than what the doctor thought I needed, I wound up having more surgeries than I probably should have. And to date, I've had 13 surgeries on my vocal cords and two to completely rebuild a valve in my stomach. It, it turned out acid reflux was a really big part of why my voice went downhill so quickly. Okay. I and, share that story. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Because I had built up a story in my head that this income from the day job was what mattered in the world was what mattered about me, that my value was tied up in the income that I was able to produce. Wow. That belief was creating so much dis-ease within my body that I was depressed, I was self-medicating, and I wasn't achieving or becoming all that I was capable of becoming because I spent all my energy and focus trying to avoid these negatives in life. In sure. psychology, it's a concept called approach avoidance. Mm -hmm. That we will run more quickly from things we want to avoid than we will towards things we want. Sure. Right. And it, 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 there's a lot of like the two pains of, of like the regret pain and then the discipline pain of coding the good old Jim Rohn. But I, I love that. But like I, you, know, you mentioned something about, you know, because I, I, it took me a long time to really become an observer of my thoughts you know, because you're you're hearing what your brain is saying. It gets confusing, but as soon as I just cut off saying, listen, I have a decision to make and I can make a decision to what I'm hearing to take that and either garbage it or take it and utilize it. Are we on the same page kind of like that, what you were talking about? Yeah, the brain is not our consciousness. So we're getting real deep and philosophical Ooh. here, but there are... In, in, in psychology, they'll call them intrusive thoughts. I call them fleeting thoughts or fleeting ideas. And I, I don't know if, any, if maybe I'm the weird guy in the room when I say this, but I would be at conferences uh, in my past life and you know talking to people, networking in a group, and you have this thought go through your head like, what would happen if I just punched this guy right now? And it's like, what? <laughs> that's, that's, not even, that's not even who I am. Where did that thought come from? <laughs> and if we give volume and voice to that thought if we yeah. if we ruminate on it it can become problematic right when we learn to just say okay that was a thought moving on observe it yeah and and that happens with all types of other thoughts not just weird sure. strange crazy ones like what i described right. but the thought of i'm not good enough right i can't do this right who am i to take this on so good yeah yeah, I, I know when I'm coaching, you know, clients, my thoughts will pop up in there and I know the direction I want to take us. But, you know, you'll start thinking like, dude, this guy's this guy or girl is just batshit, you know, and I'm sorry, squad, if I coach anybody out there, but I, I, I will have them, you know, and be like, whoa, 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 let, observe that, see it and then work the next question around it. And it took skills to do that. People don't understand. And that's where I think a lot of marriages fail. And I failed at two of them. So I can speak to it is like you're unleashing the thoughts that are there that like your thought of, man, I just want to punch that guy. You know, I've, I've had that before, you know, and to be like, wait a minute, that's not me. And then you don't do it. But if you were to do that with anything, but that's not me, you know, and do what you know is right. I think that, that that that's super powerful, man. I love that. Man, I've never had a conversation philosophically with this. I have a lot of philosopher friends and stuff like that. We get into Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and stuff like that. I've never had it on the podcast. So thank you for bringing that up, man. So 
do you do you coach people? I'm just curious about that. Do you coach people or, or consult or how, how are I, you getting your message out now? Yeah, so my, my work is squarely focused as a keynote speaker. Love uh, it. I do I do MC events. Okay. But when I started when I started this business, I thought I was going to go out and have a three pronged approach where I did speaking, consulting, and coaching. Mm -hmm. What I learned was that each of those disciplines needs to be marketed and thought of in a very specific and different way. Right. And I wasn't interested in doing three things so-so or being mediocre at three things. I wanted to be excellent at one thing. So I looked at those three avenues and said, which do I think will bring me more joy? And marrying my love of being on the stage with my interest in seeing that aha moment in people's eyes and delivering a message of value and an experience that's fun and engaging, it was very clear and easy to make the decision that I'm going to focus my efforts on keynote speaking. Now, has that led to consulting work? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm happy to take it on and, yeah. and I'm grateful for the clients that I have. I don't directly market that though. Mm -hmm. I, I get any follow on business through keynotes. That's I've awesome. I've done the odd coaching. Sure. Um, it, it, it's, it doesn't do it for me. Okay. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, I admire people that do and, and for whom it, it brings joy sure. for me, it brings a ton of, it brings a ton of anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people would flip that where it's like, uh, you know, speaking would give them, you know, cause people are more afraid of speaking public speaking than dying a lot that cliche. Right. And, and that's how I went just basically the same thing as you, but I started in the coaching and then that just parlayed into speaking and I immediately hired, you know, a speech coach if you will like how to present and thank god i did because it's like i'm super anxiety before i go out there i literally start all of my speeches um with a trampoline on stage one it helps my anxiety and two i rebound every single morning and being 50 years old it keeps me on the jujitsu mats five mornings a week it keeps me going keeps my lady happy everything and because rebound out uh, the first two minutes is me rebounding and i'm like listen if you're an inch off the rebounder you're at zero gravity you hit the rebounder you're at four times the gravity. So it's taking that lymphatic system, which is a one-way valve, and cleans it out and gets me ready for the day. But the best part of it, and you're a professional speaker, you get this, is everyone's going like this. So they're about to affirm what I'm about to talk about after, you know, whether it's overlapping your happiness or get your asking gear or whatnot. So I love I love that you were admitting or, or being transparent, I'm sorry, uh, that, you know, you do have anxiety and other things, that you took the one thing, which I, I'm going to get to a question here, you took the one thing that you felt you were strongest at because you were a performer uh, before, but do you ever have any fear about your voice doing all the speaking that you do? Yeah, I do. Let's unpack it. It is my Achilles heel in a way. Okay. All right. Because as a speaker, um, I can get up on stage. I have a defined period of time during which I need to use my voice. I have a mm -hmm. microphone, so there's amplification. Sure. But people want more of your time when you're at the conference. There are the conversations after the event, which I love. Right. Virtual was a challenge for me because I would do an event virtually. And when we're done, we close out the Zoom room or we turn off the camera and I'm I'm in a quiet room. There's, you know, there's no coffee bar to go to and you run into people saying, hey, I really enjoyed this. Or, hey, I want to tell you a story about something you said that reminded a story uh, in my life. Those are, are how I re-energize, but yes. they can also become a liability because now if I'm there for another hour, I'm now talking for two hours yeah, right? or if I'm doing pre-conference activities. So learning how to say no, even when my natural inclination is to say yes, right? to protect the value that I'm bringing is an ever evolving process. And I, I have this fear, this fear that I'm not giving my client enough value because I, you know, I, I, feel blessed every time I get to walk out on a stage. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in the plane and I'm getting ready for a program and I'm just looking out, I'm looking around, I'm going, this is my job. This right. is freaking awesome. Like I'm right. flying, I was in Ireland awesome. a couple months ago. As we're flying over, you know, they're serving a champagne on the plane. I'm going, holy crap, this is a business trip. This is amazing. <laughs> so I'm grateful for every moment I get to be up there, but I'm also conscious of the fact that they're paying me to deliver value. Right. And if that means sticking around for the whole conference and meeting people, I want to be able to do that. Right. So right. that fear is on me. And that fear is always going to be there. My job is to take that fear and say, okay, that's a fear. How are we going to navigate it? What are we going to do about this? 
Love it. I love it. I love it. And so what do you, being a speaker then, what do you, what do you feel might be one of your blind spots or something that you could level up even better? Jeez. If it's a blind spot, I'm not sure how I can see it. Mm -hmm. But I'm certainly not in the workforce like I was. Sure. So a lack of empirical knowledge about what's really going on in the workforce may cause me to overstate or understate components of a program. I think that's why research becomes so important to me. Sure. I may over research topics because I want to know that when I get up there, I'm not just an empty suit spouting hot air. What I'm saying is relevant and valuable for right. the people that are giving me their time and their attention. But I guess I'll never know. Yeah. No, that's why I have somebody that points stuff out all the time. I have, I get critiqued, you know, and that's why, and I, I enjoy constructive criticism, you know, for me. And I, and you know, I have one where I, I was an um guy, you know, and I would say it without even knowing it. And it was like kind of my blind spot of um, um, you know, doing a lot of that, you know, and, and I've had a radio show in South Florida and in Detroit, Michigan. And I would go back and listen, how many times, how come nobody pointed that out to me mm. to level that part up? Uh, that That's awesome. So let me ask some, Greg, have you seen the movie Back to the Future? Oh, yeah. All right. Let's get in that DeLorean with Marty McFly. Let's go back to the double deuce. The 22-year-old Gregory, what kind of knowledge nuggets would you drop on him? Not so much to change anything, because your journey sounds pretty freaking awesome, but what kind of knowledge nuggets would you drop on him to maybe shorten the learning curve, blast through, and level up just a little bit quicker? Well, I I found that I, I mean, let's just go deep, right? I found yeah. that I used alcohol in situations when I was uncomfortable mm -hmm. in an unhealthy way. Okay. Okay. Um, I would continue to drink even when I didn't really need another drink because I was uncomfortable. Sure. Once I arrived at that knowledge, I was able to make different choices. And at 22, that would have been something that I would have paid attention to. Okay. I would have Got also it. paid attention to some knowledge that, um, and I tell people this now, if you don't love your nine to five, do something you do love with your five to nine AM and PM. And wow. I was the type of person who would come home from a day of work, change out of the suit and tie into, you know, regular clothes, civvies and hit the bar with friends and then come home and binge Netflix, eat a late night cheeseburger and, and call it a night. <laughs> right. And looking back, if I could go from 22 to 32 and take even three hours a day, of that time, I think about the business that I could have built, the things I could have changed. Yeah. I I really believe that we don't, we most of us, I certainly wasn't, are aware of how much time we waste. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my mentor used to say, you know, work your day job, but mind your own business, right? So that's what I would do, man. I'd get it done, do whatever I had to do in real estate and then coaching and, and building an email list and stuff is something that I did and it became fun for me because I, especially when you start seeing, you know, because I had to get my asking gear a lot, you know, ask a lot of questions. And it really forced me to stretch my comfort zone to ask for that help. But then that five to nine became my life. And that's that, that's amazing. Thank you for, you know, saying that and being transparent. Well, I'll, I'll add, you know what, I'll, let me add one more to that, Scott. Sure. I read a book. My first manager gave me a book called The Automatic Millionaire. Okay. I was... Uh, shockingly not very good with money when i first got out of college i would right. get my paycheck on friday spend it right. at the bar on friday and saturday night and then come monday i'm going oh yeah. i gotta make it till friday boys yeah. let's see how much ramen we can eat this week <laughs> i would say to my 22 year old self if your income is the most valuable thing you're getting from a job you're in the wrong job wow. because yeah. a job can provide growth can provide opportunity for you to expand your skill sets and capacities. That is infinitely more valuable if you're if you're building relevant skills and capacities than the money. And yeah. you can then use the money to further increase those skills and capacities sure. depending on how you invest it. But so many people look at the job as I'm going to trade my time for money that I need 
for things I've already spent that money on. Right. For the average person, the paycheck is a pass through. It's uh, being yeah. passed through to the mortgage person, to the car note person, to their health care provider. True. What is really left? What do you mm -hmm. really get? For most of us, it, it's less than 10% of our actual annual income. Right. So yeah. if, if your paycheck is the most valuable thing that you're getting from your job, you've already lost. You've lost. It's time to make a decision. Yeah, and, and people don't pay themselves first at all. They Like you just said, it's a pass-through. Yeah, that, that that's super true. So how does... Gregory one is dash remembered that little line in between your incarnation date, and your expiration date, your life date and your death date. Hopefully it's a long ways down the road, brother, but how do you want your dash remembered? I want to be remembered as someone who left each person he encountered better than when he found them. Yeah, there you go. Love it. And do you find that it hard to have, how does this say the, the, the energy that you have, because you you have infectious energy as well. You, you're very low key right now, but I've saw you're speaking and stuff, and it's it's, it's fired up. So it, it, to keep that energy around the people that are not okay. Let me ask you this: Have you had a dud speech? Sure. Okay. And then what was the? We're not going to say a fix, but what was the adjustment? Or what well, I mean, this is a great from? story, so I'm glad you asked the question, Scott. So I delivered a speech. Uh, in the middle of COVID, it was one of the only in-person speeches uh, that I delivered in 2021. See, I told you that was going to happen. You're fine. And I was so excited to deliver this speech because, again, it was in person. At my time, I got to shine on stage. I got to see people's faces, that yeah. quick reaction that biofeedback that we get from sure. being on stage. So I drove. To the venue, it mm -hmm. was about six hours away from my house. And when I got there, Scott, the ballroom was huge. I was so excited now because not only was this an in-person gig, it was at a real legit full-size ballroom, you know, not right. just like the back room at a Holiday Inn, so right. to speak. Right, right. And the stage setup was magnificent, even though this room could have held 2,000 people. They were only going to have 200 because of the COVID protocols sure. they were following. Right. That stage, that stage was gorgeous. So now I've got a videographer coming. I've got a photographer coming. I'm, I'm finally getting some more in-person footage for my reel. I am so excited. I was the closing keynote for this conference. And when I got up on stage, there were 20 people in the audience. Okay. Because remember, it's the middle of COVID. Yeah. Where we were was a beautiful resort. And folks had said, you know, after three days of conference and stuff, I think I'm going to skip the closing and just go lay by the pool or just go hang out outside. Oh, wow. Now, photographer's there, videographer's there, the stage is there, I'm there. I say, you know what? I'm going to go out and just give it. Yeah. A full tilt performance, bring the energy. And I drown the crowd in energy. The Ooh. energy that I brought was way too much for the 20 people that were out there. It just didn't resonate. Mm. And I learned a very valuable lesson. And it speaks a little bit to that anxiety you were talking about earlier that some people feel before they go out on stage. Sure. I've learned that that anxiety is more a reflection of my desires than my audience's desires. I wow. wasn't focused on my audience in that speech. I learned a very valuable lesson from this. I wasn't focused on my audience. I was focused on me, on what that stage, that backdrop, the, the videographer, the photographer, all that that was going to do for me. And I forgot that I am there for them. Wow. What Jesus. I should have done was say, hey, friends, I know this is a bit unusual, but what I want you to do to your comfort level, you know, bring it a little closer to the stage. I see some of you in the back. Can we get just a little closer? I know you're spread out. I'm just going to sit here and have a conversation because there's more 20 intimate. of you, there's one of me, break Dude. it down, you know, what, well, what in the business you might call an acoustic set. Yeah. And when I got off that stage, I mean, no surprise maybe to the listeners, I bombed that gig. Yeah. Yeah. And when I got off stage, I knew I bombed. They knew I bombed. The meeting planner knew I bombed. And I had a six-hour drive home, and I got in the car, mad as hell, and I looked in the rearview mirror and I said, all right, dude. You get five minutes to freak out, bug out, scream out, whatever it is you want to do about what just happened in there. And then you're going to use the rest of this drive to figure out what could be good about it. Yeah. 
And what, you just mentioned what was good about it. Exactly. That came out as the good about it. It's that I learned a valuable lesson. I'm never going to repeat that mistake, and I'm better for it. Wow. Because somebody could have told me that lesson, it wouldn't have sunk in as deeply as it did experiencing that lesson. That's that's a great lesson to learn. And it's probably something that has happened to me that I didn't learn it. I just wrote it off. It's like, okay, you just have your A game. But there was a lesson there that I'm looking back in you know, my mind at a couple of those. And I, I did it. You're so worried about the anxiety about, oh, my gosh, me, me, me. It's them that you're serving. And like you said, you made it more intimate. You could have made it more into I love. Thank you for being transparent, dude. That, that, that's awesome. So what is, let me ask you this. What do you think people might misunderstand the most about Gregory? There's so many things to pick from, Scott. <laughs> um, I think that people may think that I've got all the answers mm -hmm. because I get a microphone and I get a big stage and I get hired to come and speak at all these events. And I, I mentored some people uh, a little later in my career, kind of just before I made the switch. Mm -hmm. And one thing I always made sure to share with them was, was th that, you know, I'm going to bring biases and preconceived ideas that I'm not even aware of to this conversation. You know, I may sure. be jaded because of something that happened to me six years ago. I don't, I'm not even aware that that's going to factor into the advice or the questions I may ask you. Right. I need you to be aware of that. So that's the first thing I need you to be aware of. The second thing I need you to be aware of is that I have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. Neither right. does Warren Buffett, neither does Bill Gates, neither does the janitor at McDonald's down the street. Right. Right. We are all going to experience tomorrow together. And the biggest BS that goes on in the world is other people trying to masquerade like they've got it figured out. Sure. Nobody has it figured out. It. We're all trying to figure it out. Right. I will share what I know and try to help you figure it out. And I'm going to learn from you as you ask questions and share your experiences. Some of that might help me figure it out. Right. This life is a, re is a reciprocal process. And if we're not all in it to help each other, we're all going to fail together because this BS of pretending like they've got it figured out, they've got it made. I've got, I'm not saying this to brag. There's a point. I've got friends that are nine figure millionaires. Mm -hmm. it, they don't have no problems. They've got more expensive problems. Yep. They've got dumb problems. Like they've yeah. got so much money that nothing impresses them anymore. Right. A nice steak dinner. Pff, they get right. that every day. Right. It's so it's so difficult for them Different. to find an experience that's surprising or that makes them happy that they throw stupid amounts of money at things they don't even care about because they miss that feeling that maybe you and I experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I started putting commas in my bank account, it was like I didn't have the identity to have that, you know, so I blew through stuff in in. Because, you know, you have, you know, the theory of relativity when you start making it for yourself, like everyone's your relative, right? They come to you and they <laughs> think you have all the answers, right? Or not just for money, but the answers. I'm Again, dude, you're freaking transparent. This is this is awesome. Your vibe is, is, is insanely good. So what is Gregory's definition of a life well lived? Well, I, I think I've taken this from somebody else, but uh, it's being able to do what I want, when I want with the people that I want. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And it's super true. I mean, you can't get any better than that. The decisions. And again, when he goes back to the monetary and the money, money doesn't give you anything but choices, you know, and then that you could like, you just go back, back to the choices of what, when, and with who, and that that's amazing. But now you don't even need money for that. Cause again, we go back to when we first talked about perspective, you know, and being able to do that, there's freedom. Because there's the old story about the the stockbroker that's on the beach and he sees a fisherman pull up with a bunch of fish and he's like, you know, what'd you do? I caught fish for my family. What are you going to do with it? We're going to cook it up and I'm going to take a siesta and I'm going to make love to my wife and then we're going to go out. He's like, man, you do this every day. I could help you build up the fishing business. And he's like, why would I want to do that? He goes, so you can sleep and take a siesta and, you know, make love to your wife and, it, and enjoy life. He's like, dude, I'm doing that right now. You know, mm -hmm. it's all about the perspective. And I love that we would talk about that. And squad, we are going to take my good friend Gregory Offner through our leveling up lightning round just as soon as we get back from thanking our sponsors and affiliates. 
Time to shine today, podcast varsity squad. We are back. And Greg, oops, did I lose you? No, I'm here. Okay, cool. For some reason, I, I felt like I'd lost you. Sorry about that. You I, good. I did that. And, and squad, we are back with my good friend Gregory Offner here. And Greg, you and I will meet one day and hopefully share a stage and rock it. Um, and we maybe talk 15, 20 minutes about each one of these questions. But you've got five seconds with no explanation. So you got to put it on that entertainer. Ready to rock cat. You ready to go? Let's do it. All right. And they can all be answered that way. So, Greg, what's the best leveling up advice you've ever received? Don't chase income, chase impact. Oh, my gosh, dude. I'm sorry. I'm going to take notes. Wow. And, Greg, what? share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success. Working out at least three times a week. Beautiful. Beautiful. And – See me walking down the street, and you're like, Fergie looks like he's in his doldrums a little bit, and you think that I need to read a book that might help me level up. What book might that be? The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. I've read that, believe it or not. That's that, that's a great read. Good stuff. What's your most commonly used emoji when you text? The uh, crying laughing emoji. Got it. Nicknames growing up? Giggy. Giggy. Love it. Love it. So... Chess, checkers, or Monopoly? Checkers. Beautiful. Thank you. Simple like me. <laughs> so, go, to, go to ice cream flavor. Mint chocolate chip. We're like brothers from different mothers, man. This is awesome. <laughs> There's a sandwich name, the Giggy Offner. Build me that sandwich. What's on it? Okay. It's an every- <laughs> this is disturbing that I could do this so quickly. It's an everything bagel lightly toasted with hummus, turkey breast, and American cheese. No bacon? No bacon. Okay. <laughs> Give me some man candy on that. I love that. <laughs> so if you can take a time machine, Greg, you know, you can go for one day, come back to present day. Can't change the thing. Just observe. Would you go 20 years in the future or any time in the past? I'd go 20 years in the future. I'd go in the past. There's this kegger in 1989 that I would just like <laughs> to go right back to. <laughs> I love it. Greg, any favorite charity organization that you like to give your time or money to? Yeah, I'm on the board of directors of an organization called Musicopia. We bring music education to schools and communities that don't have the funding or the ability to provide music education for the the, the students within that community. Is it nationwide? No. Right now it is solely based in the Philadelphia, in the greater Philadelphia okay. area. Okay. Very cool. We'll put that in the show notes. Anyway, Jonathan. Okay. Awesome. Last question. You can elaborate on this one. I'm looking forward to hearing this one from you. But what's the best decade of music? 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s? Oh. Gosh, I actually, I mean, if I have to pick from those four, 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, I'm going to say the 90s, but my answer would actually be the 50s. Really? I okay. love Motown, doo-wop. I, I mean, there is a whole part of a street in Philadelphia um, dedicated to TSOP, the Sound of Philadelphia. And okay. so there, there are some artists uh, from that era who made and mixed all of their music here in Philadelphia. And there's a very distinct sound and beat. Really? Um, I think the OJs would be an example of one of those bands. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just think that music has is, is got so much richness and depth yeah. um, that it's it's probably the most powerful decade of music, in my opinion. Love it. Love it. Being you know from Detroit, you know, we had Motown. And it was, you know, it was amazing growing up there. And my dad was a monster of a man. Like, he was literally like 6'5", like almost 300 pounds, but put together as a country boy from Alabama. And he used to work security at all the shows. And the people I got to meet that I didn't even know I was meeting, mm-hmm. you know, I got to sit with Bob Seger, you know, like in our basement, you know, wow. um, have that, um, you know, just uh, all the local talent, you know, that really kind of came out of Motown and ended up meeting Larry Brown, one of the four tops, lives like three doors down from me here right and like he performs on thursday for free for people and it's just so cool to go in and listen to him sing that motown and uh granted the the i guess the age in there is a little bit older than you and i but it's still I, i'm right there with you i'm an 80s guy just because i graduated in 1990 but I, I do love throwing on the 50s and you know like people will say beatles or stones and i'm like how about the four seasons how about mm-hmm. frankie valley man you know, it's like the yeah. Frankie Valley had like the, you know, uh, the, the Four Seasons had a number one hit before the Beatles, during the Beatles, and after the Beatles. 
like they, you, you, if you say I heard radio, Frankie, or, you know, four seasons, like you'll recognize 50 songs. You know, that's oh, how 100%. good they were. I love, like you just said, the 50s. That's a great decade. I should probably add that. But anyway, so Greg, how can we find you, my friend? Yeah. So I appreciate you asking that. Um, people can go to my website, gregoryoffner.com. I'm on Instagram, uh, Facebook. No, not Facebook. I'm on like Instagram. I'm on everything. I don't really hang out on, on Facebook. So Instagram, Twitter, mm -hmm. LinkedIn. Good Lord. That's what I was trying to think of. LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, LinkedIn's my, my main jam. Gotcha. And it's just Gregory Offner Jr. Just search for me. And then you're you're going to offer, a, or is it offered on your website, a one-sheeter for the seven keys to success? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So, sure. you know, you, you, you were asking about that lesson I learned, and I told that story about speaking on stage and really not being in it for the audience. And sure. one of the things that I developed throughout the course of these surgeries was an understanding that soft skills are generally more valuable than hard skills because they can be applied to any job in any industry and they also bleed into our personal life. You know, you may not impress your friends at the bar with your knowledge of spreadsheets and pivot tables, but if you understand body language a bit better, you can not only get what you want, but you can get where you want. So I identified seven core, I call them keys, skills that we can develop within ourselves and within the people we lead that will make them better. And as they grow, our business grows. Yeah, so the way that your audience can take advantage of this is just send me a text, uh, text the word keys, K E Y S to three, three, seven, seven, seven. Uh, it'll ask for your phone, uh, your name and your email. So I can send you the one sheet. I, have, I don't spam. You don't go onto some subscription list where you get sure. five emails a day from me. Uh, you know, I don't try to pitch you or sell you things. I just want you to have the list of these seven skills and what they can do for you. Mm -hmm. Because if you start to develop them within yourself, Again, I, you know, you asked uh, what's the best piece of advice I got, and I said, don't chase income, chase impact. Mm -hmm. These skills help you make a larger impact no matter what you do. And as your impact grows, so will your income. Wow, that's amazing. It's impossible for it not to, just the law of reciprocity and whatnot. That, that, that's beautiful. And I'd be, I would, you know, I, I'm going to say this, even though you said it's not out yet, but I want to be one of the podcasts that says it because it's at the end, because you people out there don't always listen to the end. But there's a there is a, a book coming out of Tip Jar Culture, right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things I do is help organizations create a culture of highly fulfilled, high performing people. And the end state of that culture is what I call a Tip Jar Culture. You know, what is a Tip Jar at a, at a piano bar where I used to work? It's it's a place where discretionary effort is rewarded and acknowledged. And when we create a culture, when we create an organization where discretionary effort isn't expected, it's, it's rewarded and it's acknowledged, people are more inclined to give you that effort. And oh. that's gonna make all of us better. I can't, I can't wait. And when that book does come out, Squad, I'm going to um, put, uh, I'm gonna do a book giveaway and I will send it out uh, via social. I'll repost the podcast interview if the book's not out by then with a, with a book giveaway on Time to Shine Today's Dime. So. Gregory, do me one last solid and leave us with one last knowledge nugget we can take with us, internalize, and take action on. All right. Yeah, you got it. As we make change in our lives, understand that it's not just us who change, but it's everyone around us by extension. What wow. I learned in my life when I started to, to build my own business was that as my quality of life increased, the relative quality of life of some people around me decreased. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't do anything to change, but because I felt better, they felt worse. Yeah. yeah. When when your listeners go to make change in their life, they're gonna encounter that same challenge, that friends right. they thought would be supporters turn into detractors. Sure. And I think just knowing that that's coming allows us to prepare for it, yes. to yes. see it faster, and yes. to make better choices about what to do next. That's, that is fantastic <laughs> advice and squad. We had an awesome conversation, very transparent. Um, full of knowledge nuggets and basically kind of a free masterclass from my good friend, 
you know, Giggy, Giggy Offner over here, but he, <laughs> see, he sees himself really as a kind of a glorified storyteller, which makes sense because, you know, being a musician and whatnot, he tells stories all the time, which he just started doing that and, and taking it and starting to rock stages now, which is just a beautiful thing. He's overcome so much with his voice. Um, you know, the he didn't let it stop him from pursuing his dreams with the operations and whatnot. And he wants to remind us that the story we tell ourselves have power. And if they're on repeat all day long and you start listening to that, then that's the route that you're going to go. You know, he wants to really work to take the irk out of work. I love that he said that. You know, you know, you can't be both highly performing and highly fulfilled at the same time because there's that harmony. Not so much balance, but that harmony. You know, you know, he said beliefs can his beliefs were causing him dis ease. So he was <clears throat> It, it, the stories he was telling himself and listening to, he started changing those and starting to work his way towards leveling up. You know, you know, he wants you to ask yourself what brings you the most joy when you have choices to make. Go towards joy. He wants you to stretch your z comfort zone without the use of narcotics. Like he got comfortable in a, a maybe a negative way by using alcohol, but he wants you to stretch your comfort zone by the use of feeding your mind the right food, you know, and if you're doing something nine to five and you, you don't like it, don't, don't be there. Like you start a five to nine, find something you're passionate about an inch by inch. It's a cinch, right? People by the, by the yard, it's hard. So you inch by inch and work your way up towards your passion and make that your vocation, you know? And I have just so many notes that I'm picking from, you know, he, he, he mentioned that anxiety you know, can be a reflection of your own desires. And that's what happened to him on stage. He was about, you know, his desire of having a packed house and only having 20 people out there instead of shifting and saying, hey, move closer, let's make this intimate. It's a lesson learned. And trust me, squad, if you listen to my other shows, you know that I've kind of came to those as well. You know, he reminds us that life is a reciprocal process. You know, we we got to do it together. Eventually, we'll all fail. You know, he wants, don't chase the income, chase the impact, which that will definitely be his quote there because that, 100% stands out to me. And he's got his seven keys to success. So make sure you text the word keys to 33777. And he's not going to spam you, but he's going to give you exactly what you ordered up is his one cheater. So make sure you get in there and do that. And, you know, and you want to remember that if you, you're going to change your lives, not everybody is going to be on board. Okay. That's going to be like the crab in the bucket where, you know, like Gregory was climbing out, climbing out, but those other crabs are like pulling him back in, but he just kept climbing and understand. He's not saying he doesn't love them and he doesn't like them, but he also understands that they're not part of his journey on that part of his life. So he might go have a beer, whatnot, with him, whatnot, but he's not going to let them influence his choices. And that's what we talk about here a lot in time to shine today. And Gregory, you level up your health, you level up your wealth, you're humble, yet you're hungry. I cannot seriously wait to rock stages with you. You've earned your varsity squad letter here at Time to Shine today. I absolutely love your guts, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Chat soon, my friend. All right, brother.